two is a man who actually knew something. One of the first authentic people that I and most of us had ever met in our lives. And of course he was autocratic about, about those things he believed in because he knew them to be the truth. Um, and we knew we were being exposed to the truth, that is to something which was absolutely practicable, which absolutely worked and which we wanted desperately to learn. One nice thing about dealing with people from the Playhouse is that they've been, they've been trained viscerally, ineluctably, to put their attention on something other than themselves so that it's a lot easier to work with them. When you have to cut through the various layers of self-consciousness, which come down to protectiveness. Most actors being badly trained are terrified of being foolish, of looking foolish, of, of, of doing something which is out of their control. I mean, but you have to if you're going to be any good. Okay, in, these, in this rehearsal period, I'm working with exercises which are the basic training exercises that I learned having to do with the Stanislavski system, or as it's sometimes known in this country, the, the method or the method of physical action. And I learned them from Sandy Meisner, who learned them from Bill Esper, who learned them from Richard Boleslavsky, who learned them from Stanislavski. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a member of this tradition. I'm very proud to, to have learned something that dates back to... 1905 that one can really use in working with the theater. The basic idea is that one only has so much concentration. If your concentration's on yourself, it can't be on your object, it can't be on what you're trying to achieve on the stage. If your concentration is on something else, it can't be on yourself because you only have that much. As Freud said, a man with a toothache can't be in love. And so what these exercises are designed to do are not to force the concentration, but to, for each actor to put the concentration on something more interesting at that moment than him or herself, that object being the person with whom they're dealing at that moment. Okay, good. What's happening in her right now? She's trying to probe something inside me. She's no. trying to... Okay, no, that, that, that's, that's, an, uh, that's an ideation. That's, that's narrative. What's actually happening in her right now? She's a little, she's a little um, uh, uh, preoccupied with... Uh, with what? With what's going on She's holding on a pose. Isn't she holding a pose? She's, Did you feel looking, that? She's looking at me. Okay, now look, that's the most important thing. Don't make it easier for the other person. You know what I'm saying? Don't make, don't narrate your behavior for the other person. That's there. We have to be absolutely vicious in the, in getting our objectives in these plays, right? Because that's the only thing which is going to bring you to life. The thing which will easiest destroy the plays is mood. It's thinking, rather than what must I do, thinking what are we feeling? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Good. What's he doing? He's listening very carefully. To me? Yes. And now what? Did he start doing a little thing about being an actor there for just one second? I don't know uh -huh. what you mean. Okay, good. What's she doing now? <laughs> She's, a, she's, a respond <laughs> she's responding with okay, that kind of good. nervous what, laugh. What's happening in him? He's enjoying himself. Well, how do you feel about that? I feel very good about okay, that. Okay, now what's happening in her? Yeah, she's, she's releasing herself now, and she's, she's bouncing with me with something that's going on between us. Very good. You're getting tired of grinning? Yes, I just Okay, stopped. wonderful. Good. Very good. Just about to say something beautiful. <laughs> you think? Okay, did he mean that? No. Okay, not at all. Very good. How did you feel about that? <laughs> Stanislavski says that the person you are is a hundred times more interesting than the best actor you could ever become. You don't have to be interesting. That's the author's job. The idea that I would like to follow all the way through to production, and that's the idea of the scenic truth, right? That's what's important is what these people are doing to each other, not what they had for breakfast. And the most important thing in the rehearsal process and the performance is to play what's happening in the moment, right? to not invent anything and to not deny anything. Oh. Okay, ready? Don't add anything to it. Don't add anything. Just respond. Okay? <laughs> the, what we're getting to in the set, what we're getting to in the rehearsal process in the script is that the play is nothing other than what we do. We don't want to narrate it. Yeah. You know? We don't want to tell the audience anything extra. You know, like British handkerchief actors who show you 15 things about their character by using a handkerchief. Who cares? The whole idea of directing a play is bringing out the performance through the actors. The rest of it is secondary. And what that means is teaching the actors the score of the play, just as you teach a musician the score of a piece of music. And the score is the actions. It's not the appearance. It's not the emotions. It's what the character actually does. So what one has to do in a rehearsal process is make clear to the actor, through explanation, through repetition, through examination, what the character in the play actually does physically. Is, is he opening a window here? Is he trying to get somebody's attention? here is he waiting for his mother here what the character actually does because that's the score of the play you were crying for some reason I said look at the camera baby 
OK, good, very good. But don't, if, that, if that's the moment, live the moment out. Neither of you wanted to end that moment there, right? Mm -hmm. Did you? No. Did you? No. Well, don't have, let it, the moment will, will, will die of its own volition. Yeah. OK? It's like, it's like rushing through the second measure to get to the third measure. There was, a, there was a great logic in it because you guys were playing it moment to moment. That's all, that's all that your responsibility is. You're trying too hard. You're trying to but make isn't that what I'm doing in the reunion? Ah, yeah. forget it. You're trying too hard. You're, you're, you're looking too hard. What you're doing in the reunion is what? Getting him to be my father. Okay. The thing is that everything, because of the nature of this meeting, everything has such tremendous importance. Well, if it has, oh, yes, 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 but you see, that's, that's it, added. If it has meaning, let it have meaning. Let it have real meaning. If it doesn't have meaning, leave it alone. Wait till something does have meaning, OK? Stanislavski said that there are three types of actors. There's the cliché actor who's only going to imitate on stage what he or she has seen other actors do. And then secondly, there's the mechanical actor who's going to go home at night and figure out what the character in the play should look like and what the character in the play should sound like and then come to the theater and give you his or her rendition of it. And then lastly, there's the organic actor. And what the organic is, uh, actor is going to do is to strive to understand what the character wants and then to go on stage every night and to try to accomplish that so that what you're seeing is, in effect, an improvisation bounded by the direction, bounded by the script, and bounded by your understanding of the action. But it is fresh, organic life every night. And that takes, it takes a lot of work. It takes about 20 years of training, and it takes a, an atmosphere of creativity. But it, it's worth it, because the, the moments you see in a theater of that sort are, are moments which stay with you for the rest of your life. They become part of your, of your lexicon of... Uh, of what it means to and be what makes well, a good play. I think what makes a good play is um, a protagonist who wants something vehemently and is going to set out to get it. Whether that's Hamlet finding out uh, who killed his father or Oedipus finding out what's, what's the cause of the plague on Thebes, you know, or, or, or uh, Nora in a doll's house finding out how she can live as an oppressed woman in a man's world, or Anna Christie finding out what she can do to get her father to take her back. That's what makes us want to come out, see the next, hear the next line on stage, or see the next cut in the movie, what happens next. When we really understand what the character wants, and we understand what they're going through to get it, that's what keeps us in our seat. You view writing as a craft, uh -huh. that you view writing as something you do in the morning. If you're in Vermont, I guess you go out to a cabin mm -hmm. and you write in longhand in a cold cabin, that you see it as going to work and you see it almost in a blue collar way. Mm -hmm. do well, you? I, I, I hope that that's true. And if it is, I think it's true uh, because of my, my home life and also because that's, that's the Chicago tradition, that uh, at least in the theater, which is the only art I know anything about, the only world I know anything about. Uh, we had the, the blue collar tradition. It's something that you did. You know, you got together. You had your theater company, the Organic or the Saint Nicholas or the yeah. uh, Saint Nicholas, Stephen which Wolf. you created. Yeah, was well, one of the people yeah. did. Or Joey Montaigne was with the Organic, and you know, Meshack Taylor and uh, Greg Mosier. And Greg Mosier at the Goodman Theater, and you had your company, and you went to work, and it was your job to please the audience. That was your job. If it was a drama, the drama had to be interesting. If it was a co comedy, it had to be funny. Period. A lot of the uh, the uh, verbiage in the play and both characters yeah. is my working out of the idea of what what constitutes worth. The student says, "I've been told all my life I'm stupid. I'm stupid. I can't learn. I'm stupid. I'm stupid." And the professor says, "No, you aren't. You're rather smart. As a matter of fact, you're just angry. I think if I can get you past that point, you'll see there's a lot of enjoyment in life which you've heretofore missed." Now, so I'm. To a certain extent, I'm being the professor, comforting myself as the student. And the other thing is, is true, too. I'm being the student saying to the professor, you can be clearer. You have a responsibility to me. I'm lost. I need your help. Uh, paternalism is not going to help. Charisma is not going to help. Telling me to go and do my homework is not going to help. I need someone to explain to me what's required of me. So there again, I'm casting myself, the writer, as the student, demanding that of figures in authority. Um, it was, it was, I, I always said nobody with a happy childhood ever went into show business, yeah. and I think that's pretty true. That's the nice thing about being a, um, a writer is you get to work a lot of things out. I think that the play got on, and I think that the movie too gets under a lot of people's skins. Because? Because it's, well, it's like, like Shakespeare said, you know, the play is the thing in which will catch the conscience of the king. People suspend their disbelief. 
for a second. I say, okay, I'm going to watch a, a funny little story, and everything will be under my control. Yeah. And then, it, because the because because of the structure of the piece, because it move it's moved so fast, right? And it's so clear what each one wants next. You get two thirds of the way through the play, and you think you know what's going on. All of a sudden, it takes a turn that you don't want, and you find that you've identified with one of the two of the other protagonists, and you start feeling like, wait, wait a second, you know, yeah. uh, 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 uh. It it gets under the people's skins, not because of the issues, I think, but because of the drama involved in the two protagonists. Each The idea that anybody could be a, a victim, and the idea that anybody could be a murderer, is a, ter it's a terrifying idea. You know, people whom we've elected to have a mythic status, the heroes, that they, that they might be either one of those things is, is, is very upsetting. Don't you think? I do think that, but I... And, and that's why we're obsessed by it, is it? You know, it, it is the incomprehensibility of thinking that our, our mythic heroes could be... Could be human, which of course they be are. Human. Because if they're human, what that means is that we're human. What tragedy is about. Uh, that's, the, that's why tragedy is cleansing, because it confronts us with, with our humanity, with our capacity for evil. And having been confronted by that capacity uh, to have bad done to us and to do bad ourselves, we leave feeling chastened and, and cleansed, as Aristotle would say, rather than um, um, incorrectly buoyed up by being reassured as melodrama does or is uh, that we that we are not the bad guy? Melodrama completely differentiates between the good guy and the bad guy, and says you have a choice: the, the evil guy in the black hat, who's a swine, or the angel in the white hat, who who's a saint. Which would you rather choose? We say, I, th I think I'll identify with the angel in the white hat, and then you leave at the end of the melodrama and say, well, boy, I'm so glad that the angel in the white hat won. I feel great. Yeah. But that feeling lasts until you get out of the door of the theater, whereas tragedy says, choose which one you want to be, whichever one you choose, you're going to be wrong. And P.S., you never had a choice to begin with. You're just yeah. human. And we leave shaken and uh, perhaps better for the experience.